Um, all right, great. And I see that Goldie has started the recording. Thank you. Um, Hi, Terry. So we're all set. So we, uh, women of Back Edmund, would like to welcome Bill Roberti, our guest speaker. He is a two-time World Backgammon Championship and author of multiple books, including Backgammon, Chess, and Poker. Um, his newest books are on uh, the opening move, how to play the opening in Backgammon, part one and two. Um, many, many people have his staple 501 essential Backgammon problems in their library. And um, we are very glad to have you here, Bill. Uh, we have glad a few. We have a few um, questions. Uh, you're gonna be doing a and A with us and we have a few questions that people submitted in advance. And then also um, ladies here, you are welcome to, um, to raise your hand and ask questions. If everyone could go on mute, unless you're talking, let's do that first. And then if you uh, want to raise your hand, uh, there is a, a raise hand emoji that I prefer that you use. So at the bottom of your screen, at the bottom you'll see uh, the different Zoom settings. There's a reaction setting that has a little smiley face. If you click on that and then click raise hand, I'll see a little hand symbol on the screen and then I'll call on you to make it nice and organized. All right, Bill. well, uh, I fed you the first three questions. I don't know if there's a particular one that you want to I'll start just, with. Let's just take them in order. Um, you can okay. read them and I'll, uh, I'll give you my response. All righty. So let's see if it, the first response was uh, Betty Kelly. And I don't see Betty on the phone. And I will read her question now. And make it a little bit bigger so I can see it. So her question was in terms of quantum complexity and maybe Bill, you understand the question better than I did, but she says she's listing games she plays or sees in terms of quantum complexity. Perhaps you've not thought of backgammon in this state or may not pref prefer to answer. How would you rate backgammon as a quantum complexity game? No, when I saw this question, the first thing I did was run to Wikipedia because I had no idea what quantum complexity was. I did manage to find an article which I could not understand. Um, so I'll talk about just plain old ordinary complexity. Um, backgammon is pretty complex as games go. Uh, go is more, chess is more, but other than that, backgammon ranks up there with games like poker and probably bridge, although I'm not a bridge player. Um, it's, it's complicated enough so that, you know, you don't become a good player without years of working at it, years of studying and playing and studying and playing and reading and doing everything else and basically immersing yourself in it. Um, so it's complicated enough to keep you busy for a lifetime, but yeah, chess and go are hard. That's, a, that, that's how I would sum it up. It's pretty high up on the game scale, but it's not right at the top. Yeah, we might need a backgammon philosopher to, <laughs> to deal with the rest <laughs> of her question. Yeah, it's good. All right, so this came from Garance Schwamm, who she joins us from France um, on some of our tournaments. I don't see her on the call today, but she, asks how to deal with trying to come back from a terrible opening. Well, um, the, the, one of the hard things about backgammon is that the dice will just give you bad positions from time to time. And if you make mistakes, the positions can be worse, but uh, you sort of have to just have a mindset that you can divorce yourself from that and you roll the dice and you look at your choices and you forget where the position you're looking at came from. It doesn't matter that you got two bad rolls. It doesn't matter that you miss, You think now you misplayed some previous role and now you're in trouble. It's just that there's a position in front of you and you have to kind of coolly say, okay, 
Um, I'm in trouble here. How do I get out of it? Um, the problem that a lot of players have is they just get frustrated. They, they kind of want to control the game more than they can control it. And a string of bad rolls or, or mistakes or whatever, uh, putting them in a difficult position just throws them off enough so that it, it becomes a, a cascading effect. Um, they roll badly, so they start to play badly. So then they feel like they're always rolling badly. Um, and you just have to, part of becoming a good backgammon player is you just take the position by itself. You forget where it came from. You forget how you've been doing and you just try to analyze it coolly. Um, and that's easier said than done. It's not a simple thing. Uh, everybody from time to time just gets pissed off at the way things are going. Uh, but as much as you can, you just fight that and just try to say, okay, I'm, I'm here to play some backgammon. and I'm having fun. I like playing this game and I got this role and I got to figure out what to do with it. And the more you, the better you can do that, the better you're going to play. But sometimes I'm making it sound easier our than emotions. it is. It's, it's yeah, sometimes easy. controlling our emotions over the board are, are, yeah. is tough. Yeah, especially yeah. if you're in the finals of a tournament and, you know, there's $20,000 at stake. Uh, yeah, it's a, that's a stretch. You know, that's going to put a strain on you, but you still have to do, be glad that you're there. Don't worry about what you could have won if, you know, if this had gone right and that had gone right. Just be glad if you're in the finals, just be glad you're in the finals and keep playing. Thanks. Our next one is from Candace. And since you're here, would you like to read your question, Candace? Oh. Ask my question myself. If you'd like to, or I can read it. Sure. Uh, Bill, I want to know your opinion of the bot insistence that you make the two point with a six four opening. Tom Gilbert is rolling in his grave. Okay. Um, all right. This is, this is a very interesting question because it gets into the whole history of backend and such. But, okay, first of all, XP doesn't say that <clears throat> making the two-point with 6-4 is just right. It's the, the, all three plays with 6-4, whether you run, whether you split the back men with a 6 and bring a 4 down, or whether you make the two-point, they are all extremely close. They're essentially, in a money game, they're tossed. You can pick whatever one suits you. Um, what's interesting about this is how views of this role have evolved over the years. Um, back in the, I would say the 1960s and earlier, uh, it was assumed that the, the, your choice of the 6-4 was either making the two-point or run, that those plays were clearly best. Two-point was a point, running, escape the back checker, those are good things to do and you could pick one or the other. Uh, what happened in the late 60s and early 70s was that the whole pure school of backgammon developed in New York. And the essence of that school, which you know, consisted of many of the top players of that area, like Paul McGreal and Chuck Papazian and Stan Tomchin and Senkiewicz and, and others. Um, the point of that school was that the purpose of backgammon, the winning strategy of backgammon was to build a prime and trap your opponent. And everything else was sort of subservient to that. It didn't matter if you got behind in the race, that was okay. As long as you were building the five and the four and the seven points and trapping your opponent in there somehow, you were playing backgammon. Uh, and then in the seventies, that idea, those ideas started to spread outside of New York because people were writing books and tournaments were getting played everywhere. And so these ideas were spreading. Um, most of those players considered 6-4 making the two point to be just a blunt. That was, had nothing to do with priming. If you made the two point, it was very hard to make a prime afterwards. So that play was just off the boards. It was okay to run and it was okay to split, but you couldn't make the two. The, and that's, if you look at the famous books of that period, like uh, McGrill's book, you know, he just, he labels making the two point virtually a blunder. Um, the guy who understood this first was Tim Holland. He wrote a book called Beginning Backgammon, 
around 73 or 74. And he stated clearly in this, and, and this made him a pariah for a while in, in New York, but he stated clearly all three of these roles were tossing. You could do anything you wanted with a 6 4 in the open world. It just led to different kinds of games, but that was okay. And he was a, you know, he was a lone voice in the wilderness up until the 90s, when all of a sudden you had Jellyfish and then you had Snowy, and then 10 years after Snowy, you had XG. Um, and they said, no, the 6 4 making two point, that's, that's okay. Um, I think I think Jellyfish thought it was best, and I think Snowy thought it was a toss up with the other two. And XG has sort of confirmed, yeah, it's a toss up with the other two. Um, but it took a long time to reach that point, and uh, I give a lot of credit to Tim Holland for being the only good player who could look at those three plays and say, nope, they're all they're they're equivalent in terms of their value. Now. What I just said only applies to money games. If you're playing a match, one of those three plays is liable to be better than the other two, depending on the score. If you're behind in a match, you want to catch up by winning gammons and making the two point becomes clearly right. Because every time you make an inner board point, you increase your probability that the game will end in a gammon for you by one or 2%. And that's enough to make it correct. Uh, if you're ahead in a match, you want to avoid being gammon, and then the running play becomes right, because that will lose the fewest gammons of all three. Um, but even in a match or for money, it doesn't matter. You can do anything you want with a 6-4. They're all fine. But if you're, if you're, since now we mostly play matches now, and, and in matches, the score is mostly not even. So one of those plays becomes correct, and it's either going to be uh, if the score is lopsided, we would be making the two point for the guy behind or making the or running for the person ahead. Interesting. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, Candace? <laughs> yes, very you have much. A follow up? Okay. All right. Great. All right. Well, does anyone have a, a question for Bill? We can open up the floor now. Yeah, I chat. Uh, I see Karen. We can use our emojis, but that's fine. If I see your hand, that works too. Karen, would you like to open up your microphone and ask a question? Uh, <clears throat> Bill, uh, Monte Carlo is going to be held apparently at the end of July. And I know that you and Chris Bray have been uh, instrumental in getting it changed to, I think, the 53rd uh, World Championship, uh, changing the numbering. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What's behind that? Yeah, um, I wrote an article for my blog about seven or eight years ago on the sort of the, the, the actual history of the World Championship because Monte Carlo took it over in 79 and has run it ever since. And they never listed the previous winners of the world championship who were clearly well known at the time. I mean, there was no doubt in the 70s and the, and the late 60s as to who the world champion was. So it was a well-defined world championship tournament. Uh, it was just held in, in different cities, Vegas and then the Bahamas before it went to um, Monte Carlo. Uh, but the Monte Carlo people only listed as world champion starting with the the 79 tournament that they were the, they, they held for the first time and continuing on after that. Um, so everybody who won the world championship between 67, which was the first year they held it in Vegas, and 78, which was the last year they held it in the Bahamas, those people were all getting slighted. So I, um, oh, and the other thing that was happening was that lists of world champions were appearing on the web, but they were wrong. And people didn't know what I actually heard. So I, I, I had all the magazines and literature and stuff from an earlier period. So I, I wrote a forum, a, a blog post, just explaining what had occurred and you know why some of the, some of the misinformation that was up on the web was wrong. And um, Chris, I guess, um, as I understand it, uh, um, you know, Chris got, Chris wanted to correct that 
uh, before the backgammon galaxy people took over the championship and continued to mislabel it. So uh, he took my he took my um, blog post and, and kind of released it uh, more widespread, and and now everybody has access to it uh, generally. But uh, there were you know it was well known from sixty seven to seventy eight uh, who the world champion. This was not a not a not a matter of, of doubt, and it was just a matter of making sure that people in the current age realized no the world championship didn't start in Monte Carlo in seventy nine. It started at the Sands in Las Vegas in 1967 and went on from there with a couple of years off in 70, 71. Or 69, 70, I think. It was held in 67 and 68. Then there were two years off for unclear reasons. And in 71, it started up again. And it was an annual tournament after that. Um, but after 78, it, it, it had been held in the Bahamas. And then Louis de Jong, who was hired by Monte Carlo to run the tournament, decided to sort of bring it Looks like, did we lose Bill or is it only me? He's frozen. Okay, he's frozen. Yeah. Okay, well, let's give him a minute to come back. I was going to say his lips aren't moving. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you wonder if it's just you or if it's them. It's all right. We'll just give him a second. I'm going to send him a text message in case he doesn't know. Oh, we lost him. He'll try to rejoin. He'll oh. probably try to rejoin. All right. Yay, technology. <laughs> it's a good thing you're so good at it. And it comes, I can't stop it if the internet stops working, though. All right, I'm gonna give them a quick call. You talk, talk amongst yourselves. There he is. Hi, I'm back. It looks like I got disconnected for a while. How, mu how much- There he is. Came through? It happened at a good time. You, were, you, you had finished up. So, I, want to I go think back we to heard, I think, we, I think, did we hear all of your, um, I think we heard almost all of your uh, story about, um, about the Monte Carlo dates. Oh, okay. okay that's yeah, good. I think, I think we got through most of it. Okay. All right. And uh, Goldie, do you have a question? Sure. Uh, I okay, great. The, I want to go back to the 6-4. Um, I, I, uh, I'm, in low intermediate high beginner uh, 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 rank um, I like if I can get the six uh, the seven point and the two point I like that because uh, I've, I've played mostly online and one in six even though it's virtual dice uh, still comes up more often than anything else and so I like to cover the six and the one you know, and not leave a six and a one open if at all possible um, I don't know. Uh, it's just patterns that I've seen from playing online for 20 years. Um, and uh, so I like playing 6-4 to cover the two point, um, but I also am not tied to it. Uh, if, if, if it's not uh, opportune for me, if it's, it's better for me to run, I run. But for, uh, more often than not, I'm covering my two point. Um, running is fine. Uh... Making the two point often goes down in value once you've done something else. Um, for example, if you, let's say you start out with a three one and you make your five point. Okay, that's very good. But now if your next roll is a six four, you're not gonna wanna make the two point. Um, first of all, to make it, you have to break the eight, which is valuable. You haven't really made a new point. You just swap the eight for the two. 
And the eight is potentially part of a prime where the two is not. So I, I, once you start with a roll like three, one or four, two, and then you roll another six, four, you roll a six, four after that, you're probably gonna run with it um, because running kind of fits in with the position you've got a little better. Um, examples like that, you know, once the game gets going, uh, you have to look at the kind of the relative value of all these plays and what assets and liabilities they create. And, and there are now no simple answers to something like making the two point. We can say on the opening roll that it's a toss up play and you can do it if you want. But if you do it, you have to follow up correctly as well. And that's going to be a little different from following up with some of these other rules. Um, if, for example, you run with a six four. 24 to 14, then you don't get hit. Uh, your follow-up is mostly trying to put some, some checkers in your outfield. Uh, that's almost certainly going to be right, unless you actually make a point. But after you're past the opening roll or two, everything becomes more complicated. Everything, Every part of the position is affecting what you do. And so you, you, you can't have a kind of tunnel vision. Or I want to do this or that. You have to look at what's happened so far, what you've done, what your opponent's done, and all of that together sort of speaks to you and says, okay, now in this new position we've got, I want to do this. But certainly on the opening roll, if you want to make the two point with a six four, that's fine. Not making a mistake. Um, unless you're ahead in the match and then, then you should do something else. But, um, you know, if you're behind or you're even, that's fine. I have recently um, uh, learned the value of building your prime from, you know, like seven or eight forward rather than from two backwards. Uh, it, it, it works a lot. It, it, work, it, it's, it works a lot more in your favor to do that. Yeah, because you already have the six and the eight. So you've got, you know, you've got two points in there. You make a third with you know some number like um, six one three one four two one of those. Once you get three points in a row, you're you're starting to think, okay, my game plan here is probably going to be priming. Um, but that can change quickly. Um, but you know primes are strong. The, the players of the '70s who had a priming approach to the game weren't wrong. It's just that they overdid it. They, they mm -hmm. liked prime so much, they sacrificed all of the game plans to get into a prime. Uh, and that was an overrun. You know, backgam is basically a game of balance. You, you look at a position and you say, okay, given this position and this role, what play makes the biggest overall improvement in my game? It might be running, it might be splitting, it might be bringing down builders. You know, it could be anything depending on what the position now looks like um but once you get a couple of moves into the game the 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 the, the ideas from the opening rolls start to fade away and you, you have to confront this new position that you've got and say okay what am i doing here? what am i supposed to do in this position and how do my different plausible choices affect that thanks bill great thank you uh terry would you like to ask your question? Yeah, first, my apologies for my cat being a distraction. Um, oh, I have a cat. That's no distraction. <laughs> Cats are adorable. Yeah, he's an older guy. And whenever I'm on a Zoom call, it, he makes it um, his business to come sit on my lap. Hey, I'm tell a, him he's welcome. Maybe you'll uh, have a question. I'm a human pet warmer. Um, <laughs> my, my question over on to the uh, opening rolls, I remember at the uh, LA uh, Open, some guy was wearing a t-shirt that said something about the six two as an initial move down to slot the five point. And I asked him about that and he said back and forth, well, I guess there's a, you know, some people that at one point thought that was the best opening move for a six two is to slot the five. And then I guess some people decided that was not good. I'm just kind of curious as to what your thoughts are about that. Okay. Uh, everybody in the late 70s and early 80s, when I took up the game, everybody played 6-2 by slotting the five point. And we just, since everybody did it, it had to be right, right? Yeah. Um, but then uh, this was not the bots idea. Before the bots came along, 
people started experimenting with splitting them back with the six and bringing the two down. And gradually that caught on. People just realized that, um, you know, that was a nice flexible position. The, you know, when people, when we were doing this, uh, there was a general realization coming along that splitting was more important than we used to think back in the late 70s. Uh, the late 70s were all about offense, you know, uh, make your five point, make your four point. If you can't make them, slot them, do anything you can, make your prime. Um, as we got a little more nuanced and started to see, okay, no, splitting is really important. You don't want to get blocked in. Uh, 24 18 became sort of the accepted play with an opening six, unless it was six one or six five. And then the other half of the play was going to be 13 to 11 or 13 to 10 or 13 to nine. Um, the, but when the bots came along, they sort of confirmed that yes, those are the best uh, opening. Uh, plays with those roles and you should do it and it's clearly better than slotting the five point which is almost a blunder so if you met somebody who thought that they're 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 a holdover from the sevens he actually looked like he was a holdover so that makes sense <laughs> yeah probably been on a desert island yeah thank you okay all right great uh peggy would you like to ask your question Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. Uh, Bill, I've noticed playing, I don't know, online a lot over the last year, that a lot of people are hitting all the time. Um, for example, you have a, a chance to make your five, but they'll hit instead. Or you have a chance to come out and they hit instead. And I'm wondering if this is the latest fad or is is this a carryover from the old days when people didn't realize they should be making their five or something like that? Um, uh, it's a it, it is a carryover from the old days, although I don't think the players you're talking about were around back then. Um, but yeah, there was a style, you know, part of the pure style was hit. And if you get hit back, that's OK, because it's fine to play a back game. And if you don't get hit, maybe you make the point. Um, here's how you should think about it. When you make a point, like the five or the four, or the seven, even the three, um, or an anchor on the other side, when you make a point, you create an asset that lasts for a long, long time. And every role after that, that asset, to a certain extent, reduces the things your opponent can do and increases the things you can do. It just affects the position enough so that some of your opponent's roles now become not as strong as they should have been because you have this point that's in the way. So think of it like a, like a worker bee. It just works for you all the time. It's grinding out a little bit of equity every turn because you have this solid asset. The problem with hitting, is that might work, might be fine, but when it doesn't work, you you don't have that asset that you could have locked up. So your game isn't nearly as good as it should be. Um, it depends a little on what kind of point we're talking about. You know, like if we're talking about making the five point boy, you, you know, you don't pass that up for very many hits. If you're talking about making the 10 or the 11, well, that's not so that's such a big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, passing on those points and hitting somewhere, um, you know, may well be correct. And of course, the other thing is you got to look and see what what checker are you hitting. You know, if you're, if you're hitting a checker that slotted a point in your opponent's board, well, that's probably almost a forced play because you don't want your opponent making those points. If you're hitting in the outfield somewhere, eh, yeah. That then, then you're more likely to think that the permanent asset is going to be correct. Bill, as a follow up on that question, suppose your opponent's opening roll is a 2 1 or a 4 1 and they slot their own five and you now roll 3 1. What will you do? Hit. Always. Uh, now, the reason is yes, you, the thing here is yes, you could make your five point and then your opponent makes his five point. And now you're in an even game. If you hit, you're a favorite because you're heading the race. That's it. 
That, that, that's basically all the reasoning you need for that. One play makes you a favorite. One play makes you pick them. Choose the play that makes you a favorite. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Gail, would you like to answer your, ask your question? Yes. Um, Bill, what's your point of view about an early double if you're <clears throat> If if you if you have a, a a an understanding that you're I would say you're more than slightly ahead, uh, but there could be a risk, of course, that the game turns. Well, uh, all other things being equal, when you double, you don't want to be just a slight favorite, because once you double and your opponent accepts the cube. Um, you know, that cube is worth a lot. And, and if you were, let's say, a 50, say, say you know, someone could tell you, uh, you're a 55, 45 favorite in this position. Well, if you double, your winning chances drop automatically because he has the, cube, your opponent has the cube and, and you don't. Um, so doubling when you're, you know, a slight favorite like that, what that means is with your opponent owning the cube, you're not a favorite anymore, you're even. Um, so leave it in the middle. Doubles, you know, the, this depends wildly on, on how volatile the position is, but in general, you're doubling when you're something like 65, 35, you know, 70, 30. That's the area where most of your doubles are going to come. Uh, your favorite, your solid favorite. He has a clear take. That's okay. Um, but that's when you want to double. Now, the other thing you have to consider is not just how big a favorite you are, but how volatile is the position. For example, if, if there's no blots around the board, then you tend to wait on doubling until you're a really solid favorite. Because if there aren't any blots floating around, there's not all that much you can roll next turn that will make you a much bigger favorite. But if your opponent has, you know, if you've got what looks like a slight positional edge, but you notice your opponent's got five blocks, well, you're going to double that. Because if you roll well and pick up a couple of blocks, uh, you know, it could be game over in a turn or two. So the more volatility you have, the less security you need in order to double. You, know, you might double, you might be a 58 42 favorite, but if you've got four blots around, fine, double now, because those four blots could translate into a disaster for him on the next turn. And you want to double before the disaster happens. Uh, great. Okay. Uh, Candace has another question. Okay, we started this group, Bill, because we want to foster women in backgammon. And I'm just curious why you think there already are not more women than there are in backgammon. Well, nobody's keeping them out. I mean, every tournament is, is, is totally open. Um, you know, I think I just don't think there are quite as many women who think backgammon is a fun thing to do. Um, you know, my wife plays backgammon and she likes it, but it's not ever going to absorb her particularly. It's not going to drive her to, to, to go to tournaments. Um, I think there are, there's a certain kind of guy who looks at backgammon and says, oh, this is great. I want to do this and, and I want to do it all the time and I'm going to study hard for years. And I'm going to play in every tournament I can. Um, and I just don't think there are that many women who look at it that way. Um, part of it is, uh, you know, part of it's a lack of exposure. I mean, I think what you're doing is great. And you're, you know, you're sort of encouraging women to, to show up and, and play. And that makes tournaments more fun as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I think they're, they're, guys have a certain obsessive quality in their mind that you know, draws them to things that require lots and lots of study and work to get better. I mean, I took up backgammon in 76. I had been a chess player before that. Um, 
But I took up backgammon because I could sort of sense it was getting to be a big game and a lot of money seemed to be floating around. And that got me very interested. And from that time on, for like the next seven or eight years, backgammon was all I did. I mean, I, I had a job. I went to work. I came home. I had dinner. And I either studied backgammon, uh, rolling out positions by hand, or I went and found a chouette somewhere to play in, or I'd play in a tournament on the weekend or something. Um, but literally, my whole life for several years was back in. Um, and I didn't have a second thought about it. It wasn't like I, I said, oh, I should be doing something else here. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing too much. No, I was, uh, I was happy as a clam. This was perfect. Um, so I think what you have to do is, you know, just expose more women to backgammon. And a certain number are going to come in. And, and, you know, the numbers will eventually start to balance out a bit. Um, but I think you'll all, you know, no matter, no matter what you do, I think there'll always be more guys playing backgammon in tournaments than, than women. Is there a higher concentration of women in chess? Uh, no, much lower. Much lower? Much lower, yeah. Interesting. That's interesting. I mean, backgammon, backgammon does have a social element to it. It's fun to go to a tournament and go out to dinner with your friends and do this and that. So chess doesn't even have that. Chess is hard work. Nice. I, I have a question. So I discovered this forum that it looks like it's been going on for, for quite some time. It's called Two Plus Two. There's a little backgammon corner mm -hmm. in it. And I discovered all of these wonderful quizzes that you have and really descriptive commentary and I go back to it all the time and I always like pick up something new can can you talk about how that started and um what that was all about it and are you still contributing to it or is it just sort of something in the past um I I contribute to I, I read it every day because I'm the I'm the uh, I'm the you know forum manager there um, and whenever there's somebody has a question, I pop in and, and give them an answer. I'm not putting new problems up there. Um, I do that on the blog that I, that I write um, on the Gammon Press. Um, it started, well, here's how it started. Um, in 2000, this is a funny story, 2003, and uh, my wife gets a copy of TV Guide, which was still being, being published then. And uh, she comes home and she says, we got to watch, there's this poker show on Wednesday nights on the Travel Channel, we should watch it. Uh, it's here in TV Guide, nine o'clock on Wednesday nights. And I said, ah, oh, poker on TV, it's boring, you can't see the cards, blah, blah, blah. She, she kept at it, she said, yeah, but our friend Danny plays poker and he's won the World Series and this should be good. Um, so, uh, so I said, okay, we'll watch. Well, turned out what we watched was the second episode of the World Poker Tour. And they had invented the whole card camera. So you could now see the cards that everybody had as they were playing a hand. Well, this was a total you know, revolution. I, suddenly this game went from being incredibly boring to watch on TV because you didn't know what was going on to the most fascinating thing you could imagine. So we watched and we watched, we watched every Wednesday night. And after about, uh, couple of months, I called up Dan Harrington and I said, you and I have to write poker books together because this is going to be huge. It's going to be great. And he thought for a couple of weeks before he called me back and said, yep, let's do it. And that was how the poker books that I wrote got started. Um, but uh, after we'd done some of that, the guy who was publishing the poker books had this poker forum, two plus two forum, uh, which is all about poker. And uh, he said, hey, you want to do a, let's do, we're always looking to expand the forum. You want to have a, like a backgammon subgroup here? I said, sure, I'll host it. And uh, that started up, I think, in 2009 or 2010. It's been going ever since. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of posts on there, a lot of good positions and, and whatnot. And uh, uh, like I say, I still watch it and I'll comment when, when necessary, which is you know, sometimes when somebody writes in and says uh, the dice on the online or sites are rigged, they know they're not, and explain to them why. But um, yeah, it's been going ever since, and no plans to shut it down. Um, 
So, uh, but if you want new positions, uh, uh, I write, you know, I, I have this blog on the Gammon Press Forum, uh, Gammon Press site, and uh, you know, you can find some there. So, what do what you write on your new blog? What is the blog, Bill? Uh, go to uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go uh, ahead yeah. and get capture some links because people are asking about the two plus two blog and I'll make sure to send out links to your blog okay. via email after. Um, but could you talk about what you write on the blog? What what sort of content you put out? Um, anything that strikes my fancy. Um, <laughs> you know, some of the positions in the in the two new opening books appeared on there at one point. Um, but you know, any just any position that that seems interesting to talk about, where I have something to say and and you know, I'd like to say it. Um, I think I'll start taking some positions from the um, you know the uh, the backgammon strategy forum uh, from Galaxy uh, and you know writing up some answers to those and things. Uh, but no, anything you know, anything I feel like the uh, article about the origins of the world you know backgammon championship first appeared on the blog. Uh, that was you know, a long way back, back around, uh, uh, let's see, when would that have been? Uh, 2015, 2016 or so, I was doing the research for that and other things. So yeah, uh, yeah I think it, it, you know, I write something every two weeks and it's on there and um, you know, check it out. Very valuable. Billy, I have a question, Billy. Yes, okay. yes, Antoine. Um, what, what do you think, what are your feelings about playing back game, back games during, in a match? Well, um, in general, back games should be very rare. You know, if you, if you play two back games in a hundred games, that's plenty. Uh, you, you're not trying to get into back games particularly. Uh, it should happen more or less by accident because you were trying to do something else, but you got a lot of block. Um, so they should be rare. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're, uh, if you're leading in a match, you don't want to have anything to do with back games if you can avoid it. Because the downside of a back game is you get gammoned or back. Game. So uh, it, it's more, it's more something you cheerfully accept if you're behind in the match. Gammon doesn't hurt you too much because you're losing anyway. And, and, you know, you can, if, especially if you're playing an inexperienced opponent who is not skilled at destroying back game, which most good players aren't. Most good players play against back games extremely well, making them almost unplayable. Uh, but if you're up against a neophyte, uh, you know, they're perfectly fine. Get eight or 10 men hit. Hey, get 15 men hit, even better. Um, you know, if you can do it, uh, you know, they, if your opponent doesn't know how to handle a back game, you can get marvelous positions where you're a very big favorite and you can redouble, you know, you can redouble before he's even left the shot sometimes. Um, but you want to be careful. They're, they're not for when you're ahead. Uh, when you're ahead, if you get a bunch of men hit when you're ahead, try to nail down a couple of advanced anchors in your opponent's board and just make sure you play from there so that you have some chance to get a shot, but if everything goes wrong, you're probably not going to get in. That's the main idea. Thank you. But uh, I love back game. I, I love playing back games uh, against inexperienced players because in the 70s, we had to learn how to do it. We got back games all the time. And you know, we were constantly slotting to make these primes. And when our slots all got hit, we have five or six men back and whoops, you're playing a back game. <laughs> Nice. I remember. <laughs> yes, you do. Those, those were the those were the days. Those were the days. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, Peggy, I know you have an icon by your name. Did you have a question? Maybe not. Which which Peggy? Peggy which Culpepper. Peggy? Peggy Culpepper. Maybe not. I see it says slow down, but I she might have hit the wrong icon. I actually yeah. have it done. No, I didn't know. Okay, all right, all right. Just making sure. <laughs> it's been there for a while. Okay. All right, Candace. Hi, 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 another... Yes? I don't know, Bill. I just don't call you on the phone and ask you a million questions all the time. 
why aren't you playing all the time anymore? Why aren't you at every tournament like some of the other old timers? Well, uh, unlike them, I'm not really retired. I, you know, I got a business to run here. Uh, I got lots of stuff to do during the day. I just don't have that much, uh, that much time to get out. Um, plus, I, I got to say, I, I don't like the idea of going to a tournament and wearing masks uh, while I play. I, I'm totally vaccinated. You know, I'm not, I'm not some anti-vaxxer here, but um, I just like being comfortable and, and I'm not comfortable particularly wearing a mask. So um, I play a lot online and that's fine. Yeah, but we've only been wearing masks and all that for the last two years prior to that. Oh, prior to that, I played plenty. Um, uh, you know, I, I usually made it down to New York for, um, you know, the New York Metro. Um, sometimes I make it down to Florida for some tournaments. Um, you know, the, the problem is I've got this sort of ongoing business with lessons and books and, you know, whatnot. It just it keeps me busy. And Patrice. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now she's she's a great wife when it comes to you know to being a backgammon player. She'd let me go if I wanted. Um, it's just that I've been too busy to go, uh, for the most part. Can you give us a progress report on your third book? Third book is all written. Uh, it's the proofread through half of chapter fourteen. There's five chapters, eleven to fifteen, um, and after it. Proofreading is done. Um, you know, I'll start typesetting. Um, probably be out in the spring. So, is it another good news moves book? What is the third book? Uh, the third book is about you know it, it's an extension of the first two. It just covers the last group of types of positions that I wanted to talk about. Um, it covers doubling in the opening in case the position is not a blitz. You know, there's all sorts of blitz doubles in the opening, but uh, I explained in book one that blitzes were not gonna be included here. They're a separate entity unto themselves, but there are plenty of positions you can double in the opening, uh, which aren't blitzes. And there's a chapter about that. There's a, there's a very big and important chapter about how to play when you have, when one side has one checker back, and when one side has no checkers back, you, know, you escape the checker or you escape both checkers, the game changes dramatically. Now. And there's a whole chapter about how it changes both for the player who's escaped and the player who is who has not escaped but is you know confronting the guy who has escaped. Um, the other three, they're about um, a lot about slotting, double hitting, things like that that hadn't been covered in book one and two. Basically, if it's an opening problem and we didn't get to it in books one or two, it's in book three, somehow. Nice. We look forward uh, to that. Thanks. Lisa, were you trying to jump in earlier? Yeah, yeah, I was actually. Okay. April, thank you. Um, Bill, I saw an interview with you uh, by Mark Olson. Yes. A, a, nice a interview. I like that. That was fun. Yeah, it, it, and it was great. I mean, it was really phenomenal. And I remember something, and I hope that my memory isn't faulty, but I thought you were saying that it's slightly better to have your opponent's bar point than your five than his five point. And I thought it had something to do with Paul McGrill said that. Um, but what 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 could could you expound on that, please? Sure. Um, Paul said in his book you know, circa 1976, that the most important defensive point to own was the 20 point, your opponent's five point. And his book was reissued in 2004 by his ex-wife who would, essentially she had written the book. Um, Paul did all the notes and figured everything out that she did the writing. Um, in, in the reissue, she made a comment in the new introduction that Paul had changed his mind and now thought that the 18 point, your opponent's bar point was the most important defensive point to make. And this was an interesting idea when I read it. Um, 
And when I got around to m writing my own opening, my own book on the opening, the, the three-parter that we're finishing up now, uh, I said, well, I ought to, I ought to get into that somehow. It, it's a hard, it's a hard question to answer because there aren't any positions where you can either make the 20 point or the 18 point and have the rest of the position stay the same so that you can measure one against the other. The pip count's always going to be a little off or, you know, doing, making one of these plays will leave a blot back in his board and the other one won't. There's, there's a bunch of reasons why you can't compare them directly. So I came up with an approach to the problem which involved setting up positions um, where there were, there were pairs of positions where in each pair you could make, like in one position you could make the five and the other position you could, you could make the, the bar point. And the positions were similar enough so you could sort of compare them and see whether the bar or the 20 was better. And the conclusion I drew after three or four pages, I think it's in chapter seven of book two, was yeah, um, the bar point is a little better uh, than the five, uh, but it's, it's not a terribly important observation because it rarely comes down to uh, that choice. You're not gonna get confronted with a, a role where you could make the five or, the, or, or, or you could make the 18 or the 20 and everything else is equal. That's not gonna happen. Um, but I wanted to kind of discuss it, you know, philosophically, because it was an interesting question. So I, I named the chapter McGreal's Last Theorem and just explored what I had done uh, and, and the conclusion I came up with. It's sort of a, a kind of a fun little, uh, you know, intermezzo in the, in the middle of, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of dry technical stuff. Okay, great. Any more questions? If not, I have one. Um, okay. So do you have any basic advice for players that are developing their game on the best way to go about improving? Yes, I do. I do have some advice for that. Um, first of all, read everything you can. Reading is good. Just we just give you ideas, uh, that's a start. Play as much as you can, because you just have to play in order for these ideas to get in your head and percolate around. And you're very, very lucky if you're learning backgammon today because you can do those things as much as you want. You don't have to go to another city to find a game to play in, or scrounge around your own city to find chouettes or anything else. You can play online all you want, there are plenty of tournaments out there, uh, but you have to play and then uh, playing is good. But the other thing you have to do is when you're playing online, recognize that every game you play is a treasure trove of insight. If afterwards you download it and you put it through Extreme Gammon, you look at it and you go through it slowly, kind of roll by roll and just see what did I do? And what does extreme gammon want me to do? And if it's different from what I did, why is it better? And you just kind of ask yourself that over and over again. Um, that's what I do now. I, you know, I, I practice against extreme gammon on the computer behind me here. And you know, it's, it's kind of essential. You just immerse yourself in the game and force yourself to keep saying, you know, why did this happen? Why did that happen? Why did something else happen? Um, if you can, you know, make a list of the positions where you're stuck, where XG says you ought to do this, but doesn't tell you why, and you can't see why. And then if you, you know, if you find a strong player at a tournament you go to, ask them. Say, look, uh, I want to show you a position. Can you tell me why this is better than that? And most likely you'll get an answer. It'll probably be a good answer. Um, but it's a process. It's you know, think of yourself like. Uh, okay, you joined a golf club, and you'd like to be a better golfer. And the pro at the golf club just says, you got to go out and hit balls and hit them and hit them and hit them some more until your body just, 
you know, reacts properly to the swing of a club and it all becomes natural and pretty soon the ball is going where you want it to go. Backgammon's like that. You just keep doing it until things start to fall into place. And it's a lot of hard work, but it, in the end, it will work out. You will, you will come to understanding it. Very nice. Thank you, Bill. Mm -hmm. My Any pleasure. Any questions for Bill? Oh, yeah, I you to, to, uh, oh sorry. The, the light bulb coming on. Uh, I mean, I'll, you, but before you, there are times when the light bulb comes on for me and I don't know it's come on until like several weeks later when I realize, oh, I learned that and I'm doing it all the time now. It's mm -hmm. good. Um, it's just a, a, the light bulb turns on sometimes without you even knowing it. That's right. A lot of this happens in the subconscious. You know, a lot of it, you immerse yourself in the game and after a while, you know, your, your, your brain starts to see things that it didn't see before. But you always want to get good feedback. That's why playing XG is very useful because Extreme Gammon will always give you that. It'll give you feedback to the extent that it will tell you this play is wrong and that play is right. That may be all it tells you, but that's still feedback. Um, you can go around the country and you can find groups of people who have played the game for decades and they're all beginners. They play against each other, they reinforce each other. And if you come in as an outsider and look at, the, look at what they're doing, they're all beginners, they're complete beginners. They stack checkers up, they don't take risks, they do this, they do that. And they all think they're playing essentially perfect back end because they're all doing it. You've got a group of five or six people, they've played against each other forever. They think that they're playing correctly. And then if what happens is, they can do that for a long time, but then what happens is one of them leaves the group and somehow goes to a tournament and discovers, oh, I'm a beginner. These people are crushing me and I don't know why. And then they start to study and then they come back to the chouette and now they're the dominant player. And the others are saying, how did he get, how can he, how come he's beating us? He used to be just like us. And kind of that's how this process goes on. You know, it's, it's, it, one player becoming good will affect a whole bunch of other players who then try to become good. Yeah, we've seen that phenomenon locally too. Uh, Daphne, <laughs> did, you, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, just got a question. Uh, when you play a tournament or when you play a game, how do you stop yourself from going in auto mode and playing too fast and forgetting about the cube? Where, how, how do you stop yourself and keep thinking about that cube um, and don't play too fast really, but keep thinking about every single position as this is a new position, this is a new cube decision. How do you do that? Uh, take a deep breath and just recognize, you have to recognize when your concentration is flagging, which will happen with tiredness. If you just get tired, it'll affect your concentration and you, you need to develop a sense that that's happening and I have to stop. So you take a deep breath, maybe after the current game is finished, get up and take a break, walk around the room, something. You, gotta, you, you have to not become a zombie. Uh, so you've got to take a break that, that gets you back in the present. So what you're fighting against is the the actions of back end, the shaking, the rolling, the moving, the pick up the dice, it can become a hypnotizing routine. And you have to fight that routine. And when you're awake and fresh first match in the morning, it's not hard to fight it. But eight o'clock in the evening after a day of backgammon, it's very hard to fight. I recommend deep breaths. I recommend stretching, anything that you know, causes you to, to get out of the zombie mode and back into focus. Yeah. Thank you. And Candace. yes, it's something every player fights against. Go ahead, Candace. Oh, go ahead, Candace. Sorry. Candace, oh, do you have a question? Yeah, I do have another question. Okay. Um, I want to know your opinion, Bill as a tournament director 
leaving aside the fact that it's illegal, I'd like to put an end to pip counting in our heads. We just came through a year and a half of not having to do any pip counting. The same people were winning tournaments, and the mountains did not topple over one another, and oceans did not rise up and drown everybody out. Mm -hmm. So the world did not come to an end. The arguments against it, at leaving it again, aside the technicality that it's currently illegal on the rules, um, and I've discussed this with Rich Minutes and Art Benjamin, the argument against it is it's a skill and don't eliminate a skill from the top players who are able to utilize that skill. The arguments in favor of eliminating pip counting, meaning let, allowing paper and pencil during the match so that we can keep track or we can add it up on paper and not have to try to do it all mentally. The arguments in favor are as follows. It saves the better player time that he can now spend strategizing it, number two, it might, it might bring some advanced, high advanced players finally into the championship division because it, we've eliminated probably the skill they're the least good at, the pip counting. And I forgot number three right now. So what is your opinion about allowing mechanical aids to keep track of the pip count during a match? Uh, I would be as strongly opposed to it as anything I could be opposed to. Um, I think that's an essential skill of the game. Um, it's just like any other skill involved in the game. It's something you train yourself to do. Um, and okay, online that skill goes away, but uh, live backgammon, I would, I would, I let me put it this way. I would not play in a tournament that allowed players to, um, you know, keep a, running total of their pips uh, on a piece of paper. Would you be surprised to learn that Art Benjamin is, and John O'Hagan are in favor of it? Uh, I'd be a little surprised, but that doesn't affect how I feel about it. Um, I, I, the problem with backgammon is not that there's too much skill in the game. It's that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, there's too much luck in the game. I would rather, I, I would rather keep all the skill I could in the game and let it go on from there. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Well, we're heading, we're just past the top of the hour. Uh, does anybody have a, a final question or two? Maybe sneak one in. It's your last chance. You must have answered all their questions really good. So. Uh, well, that was fun. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you I've so much, more. Bill. I've got one oh. more. All, All right. right. We have a All right. Question. Okay. We, we can sneak one more in. All right, Antoinette. Go ahead. <laughs> so what 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 percentage of luck do you think in in a game is in a game versus skill? Um, does it does it, it does it depend on the players? Um, yeah, well, to a certain extent, if, you, if two equal players are playing a match, by definition, it's 50-50. Uh, essentially, that's that's all luck um, at that point because their skills are, are completely balanced. Um, World-class player against beginner, it's virtually all skill. A beginner can't create positions that bother the world-class player to any extent. Uh, so the world-class player wins, you know, 80% of the game. Um, so it's just, uh, it's almost purely a function of the skill differential between the players. I couldn't quantify it, you know, closer than that. That was my thinking. As much as it irritates me, uh, uh my opponents uh, complaining about rigged dice, et cetera, et cetera, online, <laughs> <clears throat> it makes me very happy when they tell me how lucky I got, when I know it wasn't luck. <laughs> they take advantage of what may come. Well, the interesting thing about online play is that it's, it's created this whole new group of players who didn't exist before. I, I call them Backgammon's Flat Earth Society. 
you know, just like the flat earthers, uh, they believe that the dice are rigged and they're always rigged against them. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're upset about it and everything that, everything that happens somehow proves to them the dice are rigged. Plus the, the computer programs are rigged. You know, extreme gammon is rigged to favor players who play like extreme gammon. And this is, I mean, this is sort of madness, but these folks are now out there in, in not large numbers, but you know, they exist. And, and they're, they're the equivalent of, of the real world's flat earth society. You know, there's, there's no evidence that can shake them. They believe it and, and they are now with us basically forever. Well, I, I know that the dices are, aren't rigged, uh, but I also understand that, uh, you know, that uh, computers cannot have naturally random. It's just, it's not. Because I have, I've played law online enough that I can see patterns and I can kind of guess what the next dice roll may be on occasion. It's not all the time, on occasion. And I, and I, and I use that to my advantage. And sometimes I get caught to my disadvantage because I know that's coming and I choose to go against my gut and do something else and I get hit and, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I just. No, I, I do not have that skill. As far as I can tell, the dice are all in. All right. Well, Billy, no. maybe you ought to pay. Maybe you ought to pay Golu to teach you that skill. Yeah, I, I might. I might have to look her up. See what she charges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we're sure fantastic it because it's just you know playing uh, online enough to you know catch the you know to learn it. Great. Is there anything else you want to tell us, Bill? Well, no, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. Uh, those are good questions. I'm uh, glad I was here and uh, I hope I was helpful. It's such an interesting session. Thank you so much. My pleasure. This is really interesting. We, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we did record it, so we will um, send out the recording to the rest of the ladies that weren't able to attend. We have a um, quite a few ladies.